would change you. Uh, I think God could materialize right here next to me. And indeed, okay, it would be shocking, of course. You know, this would be one of those things. I was not expecting that to happen. In that sense, uh, you know, I would probably want to call the New York Times or something like that. It would be uh, again, a, a shocking revelation uh, in, in the same way that, uh, you know, if a giant pink elephant were to show up here uh, spontaneously, that would be a shocking revelation too. Um, but it, again, it, it, it would not fulfill this, again, this deep existentialist notion that uh, many people seem to just presume. So it's one thing for me to claim that I don't care. It's another thing entirely for me to claim that you don't care and that most people don't care. So uh, I'm gonna, I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's fair to assume that most of you, if not all of you, uh, do not believe in God or at least you are skeptical uh, that God exists. So let's all collectively agree for the sake of argument to assume right now that there is a God. God exists. He's real. What happens next? You know, where do we go from there? Um, do we all get down on our knees and start praying to him? Do we start worshiping? Do we rush back to church? I mean, what exactly follows? Um, I mean, some, some of you might think that, yeah, that would be a reasonable reaction, you know? I mean, if there is a God, then I want to make sure I get right with God, and that's going to be a really important thing, to reconcile myself to God, otherwise I face his vengeance, and that's not something I want to face. I'll re return to that idea in a moment. But first off, I want to say, you don't want to jump down on your knees just yet, because I haven't said which God. Maybe this is a God that gets pissed off if you pray to him. <laughs> So, you don't, if you're concerned about propitiating this God, getting in his good graces, you can't, it's not enough to know that God exists. You have to know precisely which God exists. Um, and if you have at all any exposure to, uh, you know, world religious history, you know that there is a roster of potentially thousands that we might be talking about that have mutually incompatible characteristics and desire mutually incompatible things from us. So, uh, we, we can't simply say there's a God, we have to say which God before we can know what to do with that information. Um, but okay, that's, maybe that is a cheap philosopher's trick though. Let's just say, uh, for the sake of argument, it is the Christian God. Uh, that is the God, of course, which I mean, most of us are familiar with, most of us uh, are accustomed to, the God of Abraham. Well, this still leaves a lot open, of course. Um, does this God want me to hate homosexuals or love them? Uh, this is the kind of thing that Christians are very much divided on. So even if we assume it is the Christian God, there still is a whole lot of open questions out there which have yet to be resolved, even if we identify uh, that this Christian God is real. Um, but at least it settles some things, you know, I mean, I, I know, can think, if, we, if it is the Christian God, we can reasonably assume, for example, uh, that he wants us to believe in him, he wants us to worship him, to accept his son Jesus as our savior, and so forth and so on, you know, you know all of these things at least seem to be fairly common to the Christian tradition. So let's, uh, you know, uh, we, we can make some progress with that. So let's assume it is the Christian God that exists. Does this change my life? Will I start praying and going to church and so forth and wanting to commune with God in all these sorts of ways? Uh, well, personally, no, I wouldn't. Um, you know, again, I would, I would find it interesting. It would be a fascinating topic for conversations with other, uh, you know, uh, people who are inclined to discuss this sort of thing, but it would not change my life. But again, that's a fairly easy thing for me to say. I would need to be trying to convince you that it wouldn't change your lives either. Um, it seems to me there's at least two possible reasons why it might bring about change. Uh, the first is what you might call the pragmatic reason. Uh, I don't want to burn in hell, um, so I'm going to you know, do what I have to do to make sure that God doesn't send me to hell. And if that means going to church every Sunday, then damn it, I'm getting up at 8 a.m. every Sunday. Uh, it's worth it. It's a, it's a worthwhile trade-off. Um, that's perhaps more the more old school approach uh, to God, if you will. Uh, then there's maybe the more liberal approach, which is, well, it's not that you know I'm afraid God will punish me. God is loving. That's not what I think about uh, the kind of God is. Uh, but I want to commune with God. I want to to to, to take part in uh, in His wonder and His glory and His majesty and so forth and so on. So uh, there might be other reasons besides these, but uh, I don't want to be here all night with you. So I'm going to limit myself to these two possible reasons. I don't want to burn in hell, uh, and I want to commune with God. What do I say to the person who uh, who says? I, I would, it would transform my life because I don't want to go to hell. Now, obviously, I do not want to go to hell. Uh, I, I would not embrace that, uh, that prospect. But frankly, uh, I would rather go to hell than spend eternity with a deity whose character is such that he would send me to hell for simply not worshiping him. If those were my choices, I would honestly take hell. Thank you. Uh, but maybe that's just me and, and uh, the one or two of you and the uh, others. Maybe the rest of you are not so defiant. Maybe you're saying, yeah, okay, have fun in hell. I'm going to go worship God because I don't want to burn. Um, and fair enough. I, you know, I, I would not judge anyone for making such a, such a decision. Um, but the core point here is the following. All that proves is that you care whether or not there's a hell. It doesn't prove you care whether or not there's a God. 
These are actually two distinct things. We conflate them in our minds very often. We are so accustomed to thinking of God and the afterlife as being one and the same that it's easy to forget that these two things actually come apart. There are many religions in which there are no gods, but there is an afterlife. And there are other religions in which there are gods, but no afterlife. So what matters in this scenario has nothing to do with whether or not God exists and everything to do with whether or not hell exists. So yes, I will grant you it makes a difference whether or not hell exists, uh, but it does not yet follow that it makes a difference whether or not God exists. Now the immediate response, of course, is going to be, well, but God gets to decide whether or not we go to heaven or not. God is the judge. Um, well, you know, I, I might then quickly refer back to my prior point about uh, uh, you know, uh, God being rather kind of judgmental in this regard. The alternative point is to then turn it around and say, okay, so presumably what's the alternative? If not, hell, if not hell, then what? Obviously heaven. Um, well, I would argue, and uh, this is the sort of thing I will happy, happy to elaborate on later. Uh, I don't uh, quite have time to get into the argument because it's kind of sophisticated one right now. I'm simply going to put the suggestion out there uh, for you guys to chew over, uh, and if you want, follow up with me later. Uh, I, I, I will uh, maintain that any eternal afterlife, any eternal afterlife, no matter how it is characterized, will be hellish. Um, it is the, of the sort of thing that if any of us were to go there, or any other human being were to go there, uh, blissful it may be at first, but eternity is a bitch, like Tom Stoppard says, when's it going to end? Think about the most fun you've ever had in your life. Maybe you love playing golf. Play golf for a billion years, and then you've still got eternity to look forward to. There is no sensible way in which you or I could possibly exist in an eternal paradisical afterlife. If you tried to put us there, sooner or later it would devolve into hell. So whether or not there is a God is still not the question. Whether or not uh, heaven or hell exists, that's the real question. And I would say that uh, you know, while hell may be a possibility, heaven is not. Okay, so what, that's, the, that's the old school. What about the new school? The more liberal approach to, to theology. That, uh, that, that God isn't the judge who condemns people to hell, fire and brimstone, so uh, you know, God is the, the, the being you commune with, the being who you bask in his holy light and so forth. The, uh, the purpose of our lives is to, to, to reconcile ourselves to him. What if I want to communicate? What if I'm an atheist who doesn't believe in God, but would like to believe in God because I like the idea of communing with God? What do I say to that person? I say, well, what's stopping you? The mere fact that you don't believe in God uh, shouldn't stop you from trying to commune with him. God doesn't have to exist to commune with him. Billions of theists commune with God every single day, his non-existence notwithstanding. So clearly, uh, uh, there's nothing preventing the atheist from getting down on his knees and praying and worshiping to God. In fact, you know, there are uh, many, many closeted atheists who have yet to just sort of come out of the closet, who are so accustomed to that religious tradition, like Dr. Connolly was talking about. Uh, they're just, it's such a part of them naturally that they still go through the motions. They still pray, they still say the catechism, they still go through any sort of number of religious hoop jumpings that, uh, that they do, um, even though they don't believe. So if, if all you want is that uh, to, to commune with God, you can do it whether or not God exists. Again, it doesn't, God doesn't have to exist for you to have that. Um, what, what matters is not whether or not you commune with God. What matters is whether God communes with you. And stop for a moment and entertain the possibility that maybe God doesn't want to commune with you. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm assuming it's the Christian God, I'm assuming he's a God of love, but hey, I love my mother, I don't want to talk with her on the phone all day. So, yeah, maybe God is real, maybe God loves you, that doesn't necessarily mean he wants to hear you pray and complain all the time, but a side issue, again, a, 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 a pet peeve. Um, what matters, again, is whether or not God talks to you, not whether or not you talk to God, that's where the real community comes from. Um, but, of course, the vast majority of theists, uh, God doesn't actually talk to them. They talk to God, and he talks to them in some abstract way, through his creation or some such. But they do not literally hear the voice of God. Some do. Uh, but Thomas Zaz, the psychiatrist, has a great line on this point. He says that if you talk to God, you're a theist. If God talks to you, you're a schizophrenic. So if what you're asking for is for God to speak to you, then I ask you, how would you distinguish that from wanting to have a schizophrenic break with reality? Because from the inside, it looks the same. Whether or not God's talking to you for real, or whether or not the voices in your head are telling you it's God, that appears to be the exact same thing. So I don't see how wishing for one is any different than the other. And I clearly don't think people wish for have schizophrenic breaks with reality. So I don't see why they would want God to be talking to them, since for all intents and purposes, that amounts to the same thing.